come find a place to be. Uh, so some of us came back from elementary camp yesterday, but the title of this song was our theme for the week out there. But one uh, aspect, I guess, of worship I'd like to share from the last week that's cool. It's, it's, it was really fun at camp when we're not actively in singing or whatever, really there's no particular task going on, nothing going on, but you hear the kids singing the songs that we've been singing when no one has told them to do so. Uh, anyway, that's, that's a cool experience, so that's something I enjoyed from last week, but anyway. In heaven the armor will enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory. God, I pray for uh, people in the state and in the nation. I know the heat is really setting in, and there's a lot of fire. We can see the smoke on the mountains, God. Um, I pray for your will to be done in that, and that you provide safety to the people that you provide safety to, God. And I pray that uh, you help us in this next week, as you can read in our pamphlets this morning, God. Um, we want to love each other, and we want to help each other uh, walk in Christ. Help us do that any way we can, God. Help us to see the opportunities that where you want us to be, what you want us to do, God, uh, what, what you want us to say. Uh, and may we present ourselves this morning uh, to glorify you and your son uh, so that we can take that passion, that we can take that love uh, for one another into the week to come. Uh, God, I thank you so much uh, just to be able to get up and, and, and join together with a family like this. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I woke up this morning with my mind stand on Jesus. Yes, I stand. I woke up this morning with my mind, with my heart stand on the Lord. 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
morning, church. So I didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare my words for you. So instead, what I'd like to do, let's go to 1 John chapter 2. And I'd like to read this scripture that I've kind of been studying out. It's been very empowering for me. 1 John chapter 2. Let's we'll start in verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation of our sins. And not of ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever follows his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says that he remains in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Beloved, I am writing a new commandment to you. Sorry. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. The one who says that he is in the light, and yet hates his brother or sister, is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother and sister remains in the light, and there is nothing in him to cause stumbling. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because of the darkness. He has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgive, forgiven. Uh, because your sins have been forgiven you on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God remains in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastfulness of the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. The one who does, does the will of God continues to live forever. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard, the Antichrist is coming. Not even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out, so, so that it would be evident that they all are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar except the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, see what you heard from the beginning remains in you. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. And as for you, the anointing which you received from him remains in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as just as it has taught you, you remain in him. Now, little children, remain in him,
so that he appears, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not draw back from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness also has been born of him. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you in humbleness. We want to ask that, that you would guide us and that you would help us be of you. To not lie to ourselves, to not deceive ourselves, and not let other people deceive us, but to be one in your truth. Let us uh, be guided by you. In your son's name we pray, amen. amen. Let's, uh, let's take communion now. And just, just have a, have a moment with God. We saw thee not when lifted high amid that wild and savage crew, nor heard we that imploring cry, for if they know not what they do, but we believe the deed was done that should be. Amen. 
support and sustain ourselves. We don't create reality for ourselves out of thin air, but we rely on it coming from a, a higher place, a higher source. Uh, all good and perfect gifts coming from above. Amen. Thank you, Coulter, for leading us in that. As I uh, paused this morning in reflection, I, I remembered it. In these busy times when there's so much going on, so many possible things to do, I want to urge you to think ahead a little bit and consider who you can invite into your plans. Uh, so many times these days with instant snap decisions, hey, let's go do something this afternoon, and it's, all, you know, it's already 11.30, uh, that can be hard to do. So I urge everybody to take some time in prayer and think about the ways that you can invite people that uh, you want to be closer to or you want to support in their walk in Christ and say, hey, we were going to go tackle this activity. Why don't you come with us? And it, that's a really important way of sharing. Uh, maybe you remember, this is not what I'm preaching about, but you, you maybe remember that Jesus found some people and he said, come with me. Remember that? That's the way. Having some people go with you in what you do. So make sure that it, as you pray, you can reflect on that, and you know, it could be people who uh, haven't thought about coming and meeting and mingling among us yet, uh, that you could invite, is, is it down to the river, is it down to the, you know, up to the campground, wherever it might be that you go, uh, that could be a really important connection point for somebody, and that's, that's the example of Jesus, so be thinking of that be hard to pull off these days. All right, let's take a look here. I hope we'll open to Romans chapter 5 as we are going through this. Now, for those of you who haven't been part of this journey, we've been going through Acts as a historical contextualization for the New Testament letters. We got to this point here where Paul is, is about to make his move from the Aegean region to take a, a large contribution from several congregations down to Jerusalem to support the Lord's followers in that area who were having a famine created um, by who knows what, and there's some histories to that, but the, the believers in the Jerusalem area of Judea were facing food shortages and, and high prices for food, hard to get, so the people from the Aegean who appreciated that uh, those people had sent forth missionaries through the, the eras, uh, they were sending funds back to support them, 
Paul was going to take that to Jerusalem, knowing that his next move was to be headed on to Rome. So somewhere as he's writing, a, well, as he's going through this process of making the final collections and preparations, he sends this letter to the people in Rome to say, hey, when I get there, I want to be on the ground running. I don't want to have to go through all of this stuff and explain the basics of the gospel. So read this before I get there, and then we'll fly. We'll, we'll work. He didn't know exactly what his situation would be, but that is the historical basis for this. So you'll, it, as you go through Romans, it might surprise you, I think this passage is a great demonstration of this, that the concepts in Romans aren't actually so profoundly deep that you have to have some kind of high IQ to understand them. What's phenomenal about Romans is the amazing number of, of aspects of the truth that's in Christ that are interwoven. That he, by inspiration, and I was sharing this this morning, that part of the reason I'm convinced that the scriptures are actually from the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit moved people to put these words down, is a mere human mind couldn't pull off what we have right in front of us. The amazing numbers and, and aspects of, of lines and streams of thought come together in a confluence in in this explanation of the gospel in Romans, that it, it becomes something of a swirl. I saw a, a stream of water this last week that has confluence, right? The streams flowing together uh, in the beautiful uh, mountains of Montana. And it, it, as I was meditating on this, I, I began to realize that could be an illustration. Maybe you sat at the, the bridge area of, of Yellowstone Bible Camp and watched the water. And even though there's so much going on, that, you know, that kind of thing could go on. Uh, the, the streams from the west and, and from the south coming in, uh, bubbling, frothing, cheerfully coming together. Uh, there's a serenity about that still, isn't there? When you sit and watch that there's so much going on, it, it doesn't make you feel stressed out to realize that, that there's so much uh, goodness that comes together there. And that's just in water. I was noticing the, the way some of it circles back, and it actually flows upstream a little bit because of the way the energy mingles. And there are points in it, and of course this changes from level to level as the seasons go by, but there are points in there where the, the water from deep below is welling up and kind of bubbling up to the surface. And I, as I was meditating on the beginning of Romans chapter 5, I thought, wow, isn't that a very apt description of what we have here? There's so much fresh and, and clear and crisp and rejuvenating life in the gospel, and it comes together with such a beautiful uh, sense to it and combination that it's, it's like that. And so you can go line by line in this explanation of the light that's in Christ and, and see different truths welling up. And it's, it's clear, and it's crisp, and then if you look over there, another one flows through. Uh, and so I hope that as we read this, I'll, I'll go through this fairly slowly, as you reflect on what it is that Christ has done. What the amazing array and diversity of effect that has happened because of this achievement that God has pulled off in Christ. We're seeing about the fundamentals of that, the, the gospel, and Hey, we didn't see it happen, but we believe it happens, and we believe that what we're about to read is real because of what he did. And as much as water is necessary for us to live physically, you think about the blessing it is that water flows down off the snow melt and off the precipitation that happens more over the mountains, and it flows down into the valley so that we can irrigate, irrigate crops with we can have a drink, it's so fresh, and if you're on a hike out there, it's nice to have a way to get the water and just drink it again. Oh, what a refreshing blast of life. The gospel is even more vital for the soul. Without this truth, we would be parsed and we would just die. Not just individually, but all together. Okay? So as we reflect on what we desperately need, notice the way this describes how it is provided to us. 
Let's not go too fast. We might miss something welling up. We might miss a current crossing over. I'm going to start in chapter um, chapter 4, verse 22. Therefore, righteousness was also credited to Abraham. Now, it was not for his sake only that it was written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom righteousness will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. I'm going to leave a moment of silence so you can go back and look at what caught your attention. Notice the stream. Now, the section that we could identify as chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, there's something of a foreshadowing and a table of contents in there, making reference to some main principles that he talks about from earlier words in this, in this writing, and then foreshadowing and teasing some explanations and some expounding on these principles that he's going to get into in future parts of this writing. Here, they're shown together, line by line. And their relationships among each other can be seen a little bit. Even though he doesn't go into depth about exaltation. He doesn't go into depth about the hope. He doesn't go into depth about the glory of God and all of these kinds of things. They're shown here like the stream flowing through, as he's going to help us understand in, in future detail. Phenomenal. This is a phenomenal piece of writing. That's why I say we can accept this coming from the Lord and rejoice, right? So we've talked about before how it is that we have our standing with God, and he emphasizes it here. We have our continued place with God. This standing is, a, as one of the translations has it, in his grace. Okay? That by the working of Jesus, a change has happened to us and to our condition, and we talk about it as justification. How we have been moved from being in an enemy status to a reconciled status. So we can realize, I think everybody here has the honesty to admit, that there have been points in our lives where the way in which we lived worked counter to God's will. That the ways we acted, the ways we talked, the attitudes we showed, um, who we included, excluded, uh, praised, demeaned, right? All of those kinds of behaviors at times we were opposed, and the effect of our efforts and actions were against what God wants. That makes us enemies. And especially in the light of his eternal justice. 
But that's not the case for those then who have come to trust in God. Those who have believed in God who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. And so then he says, and a phenomenal thing has happened. Because there was a reconciliation, I really just delight in this turn of phrase. Verse 25, he was delivered over because of our transgressions. This is the plan of God. That his prized, one-of-a-kind, majestic son was delivered over to death as our sin to take our place, to cover for us because of the way we acted in enmity toward God. And it says, because of the justification that wrought, he was raised. There's something about Jesus' willingness to die for our sin that was part of the justification, the reason for why God raised him and exalted him and put him above everybody else. That he has the name that is above all names because, as it says in Revelation, he tasted death for everyone. And now that, now that we're justified and reconciled with God, no longer to be enemies, but being in, at peace with God, the resurrection of Jesus, which he has, at least in part because of his willingness to die for you, that resurrection and his exalted continuing position at the right hand of the Father is reason you can be sure of salvation. Not just that you can be reconciled until you live out your, your life here in this body, but that he is going to continue to keep you in his life. I think verse 10 is so amazing. Having been reconciled by the death of his son, we will be saved by his continued life. Awesome. This is what we need. This is what our hearts long for. Without the assurance of this, we would face a, an utter disappointment. Because you're a spiritual being that is made to live. So you think about the results that this would have in your heart. If you were to, to rest in this, to exist in to have your standing in this, you would exult in hope of the glory of God. What does that mean? There was one of the seasons when I went through the Romans and I noticed how often the Holy Spirit points out God's glory to us in this writing. You're made for it. You're made for the glory of God. But because of sin, all fall short of the glory of God. Remember that? That's a famous passage. But here now, he says, because we have peace with God and we stand in his grace, we exult in hope of the glory of God. This is an attitude that, that we're supposed to show day by day, situation by situation, exaltation. A rejoice is another good term for this. So there, there would be a way in which we would show that our heart is glad. That there would be, this gets to the edge of bragging. Okay, this gets to a point of, uh, if, that you might think somebody's going to exult in, in winning the championship. Okay, something that they would feel like, this is the this is great. This is the biggest it gets. And I think sharing in the glory of God is bigger than even the Vince Lombardi trophy. Sharing in the eternal, exalted place of God, not wrecking it, not defiling it, belonging in the glory and majesty of God to where my being there doesn't ruin it. You remember the, the famous old joke, I don't want to belong to any club that would let me in. Right? That's a paraphrase of, of some comedian from 50 years ago. But no, you can exult in hope that you being in the presence of God would not degrade the scene. That it would be right for you to be there because of the working of Jesus. Yes! That's what an exulting might sound like. I'm not sure how it would sound like coming from you, but not only does we exult in our tribulations, he's going to unpack that a lot later on, knowing that these tribulations actually contribute to our becoming this glorious person. They help us to lay aside all of these, uh, all the baggage and junk that would keep us from belonging in the presence of God. 
it doesn't disappoint because he's also going to point out here, you notice, the next stream, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us as the love of God poured into you. And then the love of God is a substance. Think of this, that the Holy Spirit here is likened to the, a water that can be, uh, Jesus did this as well, didn't he? Can be poured into your heart. The love of God is that real, that substantial. And your soul is made to hold it. Your being is created, designed to have poured into you the love of God in the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's who you are. How are you going to have that any other way? And that is another reason we can have hope in the glory of God. And he's saying here, look, if he's going to unpack this further in Romans chapter 8, isn't he? Where he says, look at your situation. If, if he would send his son Jesus to die for you when you were helpless, a sinner, in a condition of enmity with God, if he would let his son arrange for his son, deliver his son up on the altar to die in your place when you're in that condition, he'll provide you everything else. And so we exalt. Verse 11 brings it up again. Not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. I thought we should pause here and notice this kind of love that God has for us. This is different. God would remind us, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He emphasizes it by saying, you know, for, and I think he means self-righteous. For someone who pats himself on the back as being this awesome person, nobody's going to die for that person. Somebody might be willing to die for someone who they feel like is a really good person. But this is what God did. When we were still enemies, despicable, deserving of wrath, the reason for God to be so upset That is when Christ died for you. That's what love really looks like. That is the kind of love you need to hold on to. You have to realize that the truth of that is the way that God cares about you. That's the extent to which God wants you. And in fact, that situation when you were his enemy, when you were not reconciled, when you stood apart from God, it is part of the problem in all of reality. Part of what was so disappointing and hurtful to God. That was the moment when he had a chance to show what he's really like, what he's always been like, what he's always going to be like. That is when he can sacrifice what is so precious to him for the sake of transforming you, for the sake of redeeming you and me. So he can show us what love really is. And I suspect you knew you think about it, you knew that that kind of love was out there. There's something in each one of us that knows that kind of love. Here's one of the reasons why I think everybody was already looking for this. If you know somebody who was deeply let down by parents, you know how damaging I would, I would submit to you that parenting offers a chance to show at a human level this kind of love. Because when a baby is new and tiny and helpless, they consume a lot of time. Just ask the moms. I've said this before. I think this is a, a key reason why Mother's Day is so much bigger deal than Father's Day. They make a lot of mess. Can't help it. Yeah, they shout through the night. They shout through the drives. Not all of them, but it's pretty common. I mean, if you ever think you're going to raise kids, you need to expect this. Okay? They can't help around the house. They can't change the oil. They can't even bench press their own weight. And yet, everybody knows that parents ought to sacrifice for the well-being of that child while the child goes through this stage by stage. But notice something. 
the parent, everybody knows that they want their parents to act like that toward them, even though their parents don't even know what they're going to be like when they get to adolescence. For those of you who had godly parents that were empowered to treat you in a caring way, they were there night by night, day by day, even though they didn't know what you would say to them when you were 14. They didn't know the condition that you would leave the house in with your friends when you were 15. They didn't know what you would do to their car when you were 16. You hear what I'm saying? They didn't know the way in which you would behave when you were 17. And is this going to get sideways? Was, are they going to make the news and police reports? And on and on it goes. They just didn't know if they were going to become friend problems and romance problems and all, all these kinds of things. Your parents, they, if they were godly, they had the ability to treat you like this when you were two days old or two weeks old or two months old or two years old. Okay. To lay down their pleasures and their preferences and their life for you, that is, that is love like God. Love. And if you didn't receive that, you know you wish you had. And if you know people who had to get through life without being loved that way, you know how much it hurts them. You know the setback that that is. You know the harm that that has done in their figuring out how to be a, a transcendent and, and empowered and joyful person. This love that God has, this love that God has demonstrated is the love that you're created for. The good news is, to the extent that your parents did not love you like God did, God has. Do you hear this? Nobody here had a parent as good as this. Nobody here. I don't care how good you thought your parents were. None of you had a parent that loved you this fully. And this passage says right here that the historical evidence is that God does. We all have to move beyond the people that we wished had loved us like this because God is here. He is saying, I just wish you would call me Father. Jeremiah. Didn't Jesus teach us to pray? Our Father. While we were still helpless, that was the right time for Christ to die for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And now we see this aspect of it where he didn't die just for you like this. He doesn't love just you alone like this. He loves all of us like this. He loves us together like this. That, that Christ died for us as a collection of God's children. So having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. <coughs> if there was one aid to life that I was praying that come out of noticing this this morning, it would be then that exultant life, that no matter what your background is, no matter where you come from, or what your parents were able to be, or what your romances were able or unable to be, that when you receive this from the Father, you can live in exultation. You see the difference between the exaltation of gaining triumph for yourself and looking down on those who you might have defeated versus receiving the love of our loving Father and an exultant life that welcomes and delights in everybody else joining in. We're reconciled not just to God, but then to each other, and we have peace. A peace and an exaltation, that is the condition for human Living. This is thriving. This is eternal life. 
So as we go into these different streams and eddies and upwellings of the truth that we find in Christ, we can exult in these different aspects. I just urge and pray that you will sit back and reflect and meditate on this for yourself. Instead of being angry that God didn't make somebody else be like this for you, be thrilled that God himself is offering this to you, holding this out for you to live in day by day. And we can rejoice and exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the reconciliation. Now, this is written to people who have received the reconciliation. And I'd say that all of us who together exult in hope of the glory of God, all of us who exult in this love of God, who exult in having peace with God, so in the kind of relationship that we ought to be, we want to invite you into this reconciliation. This is a great opportunity if, if you haven't understood this, if you haven't left the condition of enmity with God and being in this ungodly state in the reason for wrath. Come join us through Jesus in this reconciliation. When you too can live in this exultant life of peace with God. You, you'll know somebody in this room who can talk with you about that. Seize the opportunity. And those of you who are in this room who are sharing in this exultant life, let it come out day by day this week. And if you know someone in here who hasn't received that, invite them on a personal level. Just say, what do you think of that? What do you think of this peace that we ha can have with God through Jesus Christ? Would you, would you like to receive and join in this reconciliation by trusting in Jesus? Just ask them and see what they say. You don't have to point to yourself as the perfect example of everything because God is. Point to him and say, come walk with us. Come live this life in Christ with us. And that's what we offer in, in our exaltation here now as we stand and sing. Lord, I commit my life to Thee. Take it and make it Thine own. Make me Thy servant that I
couple of announcements. Um, in light of the 95 degree weather that we've been having here in the last week and probably more to come, I wanted to put the winter rendezvous on your calendars coming December 12th through the 15th. Um, great time of gathering for uh, family and Christians all across the region as well as from Texas and everywhere. Um, any questions, ask Addy. Uh, one prayer request is for uh, Catherine's family and some of the issues that um, they've been having in Columbia. So keep them in our thoughts. Continue to pray for, their, for our building and our building committee and for Chuck, uh, everything that, that's involved with that. Um, we are seeing some progress, but we just need to continue to pray that uh, we're doing God's will and doing that work. Any other announcements? Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Uh, we do thank you for this beautiful weather we've been having. Uh, we ask that you, you be with us not only as individuals, but as a country as well during this time. Uh, there's just so much turmoil, so much anger and hatred. Lord, help us to turn to you for, for love, uh, showing us how we can love each other uh, the same way that we love you and the way that you love us. Lord, please be with us as we go through this week. Uh, we thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, 